Good morning again, Salem. If I haven't met you yet, I'm Pastor Jason, and today we're finishing up this series that we started in the busy month of August called Hold On. I'm excited that next week we kick off Red Letter Challenge. Hey, one of the reasons why I would say I feel comfortable standing in front of you as one of your main preachers and teachers in this place takes me back to a very uncomfortable moment of my seventh grade year. I went to a Lutheran school that was smaller than Salem, and at the end of every year we had a spring musical. And my seventh and eighth grade classes decided for that year that we were going to kind of put on a little play of sorts to the fairy tale, The Emperor's New Clothes. Anybody know this story? Maybe a little? Well, I had the distinct privilege of being the emperor. That means I had to learn over a hundred lines and recite them. I had to walk out in front of hundreds of people wearing long underwear, but that wasn't the most uncomfortable part. You see, this was the spring of my seventh grade year and my voice was changing. <laughs> so for over a hundred lines, I was trying not to be the center of attention, but I was the emperor sitting on a throne of self-consciousness and timidity. It was not my best moment in life. I don't know if seventh grade is even the best moment in anyone's life for that matter, but regardless. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about the busyness of life and how that tries to be a bit of an emperor. It tries to control, it tries to be the master of your life right now. Busyness acts like one who sits on a throne, but it is not a good master. We're going to look at a different emperor today, an emperor that was over the city of Laodicea, and we're going to consider uh, the impact that he had on that community, but also our lives and Jesus' word through all of it. And I want to start by telling you about that emperor Domitian. I suppose many emperors and leaders back then, uh, when they died, they were deified. Like, yeah, that, that was a god. Yes, he was a god. Domitian had the nerve to say, even while he was alive, I'm a god. And he demanded people's worship by threat. So if people wouldn't worship Domitian, he would threaten to take away their job or to uh, throw them into prison or to even kill them. And Laodicea was a place that had three main economic arms, three kind of main trades. One was banking. This was a very wealthy city. It was right along some trade routes. So lots of people would stop through Laodicea for their banking. The second was textile production, making clothes. And the third was medical ointments, especially those for the eyes. So they had kind of a med center, they had a banking center, they had a retail area for clothes. This was a happening place. But for the Christians in Laodicea, this was a struggle. Since a great deal of Laodicea's wealth depended on trade, the Christian merchants were in a quandary. Would they cooperate with the imperial cult, I think that's a funny phrase, and maintain their trade associations, or would they forswear Domitian and reaffirm their faith in Christ? Forswear, to give up on. You see how they're, they're stuck in the middle. They're, they're trying to keep allegiances with both sides. They're trying to worship God, but Domitian is saying, I'm the God. And they don't want to lose their economic status or maybe their time with family and friends getting thrown into prison or even their life. And the Christians in Laodicea were riding that fence pretty hard. They were struggling a bit through that. So our Lord Jesus has some pretty targeted words to those folks today. I pray they connect with us as well. Revelation chapter 3, starting at verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. These are the words of the amen, the truth, the yes, yes, so shall it be. That's why we say amen at the end of prayers. And Jesus says, these are my words. And by the way, I'm the ruler, not Domitian, not some emperor that's going to wear new clothes. No, I'm the ruler of God's creation. 
And then he says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Oh, (laughs) any of you a big fan of lukewarm coffee? How about room temperature water? There we go. Or like tea, no ice in it, yeah? You feeling good about that? Nobody likes that. It's, It's tepid. You say the word tepid a few times, tepid, tepid, tepid. My stomach starts to turn. We like our food and our drinks, hot or cold, pick one. But not tepid, not lukewarm. And Jesus says, I see it. I see that you're riding the fence. You're trying to be faithful to some emperor named Domitian, but you're trying to be faithful to me and it's not working. Pick one, Jesus says. I'm the master. I'm the one in charge, so pick one spit you out of my mouth. The, the folks in Laodicea would certainly connect with this imagery. Their water supply was six miles away. So their water would come by underground aqueduct and it was never cold and it was never hot. It's like turning on the tap water in Texas. <laughs> but they would get it. They would understand the language that Jesus was using. And he's saying, this needs to stop. I'm going to spit you out. That's no good. And then Jesus quotes someone from the church in Laodicea. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Ouch. And I think deep down when we see words like that, We can't help but think of our own lukewarm sinfulness at times. Jesus says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. What were the three arms of economic prosperity in Laodicea? Banking textile production, and medicine, medical ointments, especially for the eyes. Jesus says, you want true wealth? You want to be rich now and for all eternity? I'll provide that. You want covering for your nakedness, your sinfulness? You want medicine? You want the cure for your sin disease? I've got that. Jesus says. And then he says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Dear friends, I think we struggle with the same things Laodicea struggled with. We live a a lukewarm faith at times. It's not that God doesn't exist, but we've kind of lost a little of our passion, maybe a little of our zeal for the Lord. There's other things we get really passionate about at times, and we put them on the throne. We say, this is the most important to me right now, maybe even in busy seasons. They're the thrones that we hold on to when life feels out of control. And it might be more wealth. It might be new medicine. It might be better clothes or other possessions. And we put those things up on a throne or we place ourselves on the throne in some self-centered way. I would guess that none of you openly dialogue with people as if you're a God and you're demanding people's worship. But I know I struggle sometimes with really hoping that at work people respect me and people at home serve me and meet my needs and maybe you're with me on that. We live a lukewarm faith at times. And our Lord Jesus says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Which of these words sticks out to you most? Is it rebuke? Is it discipline? Repent? For me, I'm digging love. Jesus says, those whom I love, including the people in Laodicea, 
who were lukewarm in their faith, including the people in Tombaugh, Magnolia, Cypress, Woodlands, Waller, including us, those whom I love, Jesus says, his love never fails for you or me. His forgiveness is here today and we turn back to him. We, we repent, we turn around from our lukewarm faith. Another Bible commentator I like says, the problem of modern evangelism is not hostility to Christianity. It would be better if it were so. The problem is that to so many, Christianity and the church have ceased to have any relevance and men regard them with complete indifference. Do you feel this in 2023? Do people feel like God's word of truth through Jesus Christ is relevant to their day-to-day lives? How do people view the church today? Is it, isn't it a little bit with an indifferent attitude? It's, it's not like they bash God or, or yell about God, but it's kind of a meh, meh. I think that's what we would get if we go to the Woodlands Mall and start talking to people. I think we'd get that if we interview a bunch of people on 1960. I think there's a general indifference towards God. Maybe not in this room. I mean, you showed up today on Labor Day weekend, everyone. Way to go. But sometimes our attitudes treat God with a little indifference. Do you want to know when this Bible writer, William Barclay, when he, uh, this commentator, he wrote this in 1976. That's what he was feeling back in 76, almost 50 years ago. And I think over the last 50 years, our world has lost a little passion, a little zeal for the Lord Jesus. Our Lord says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Even though we've kind of lost some passion, even though we act a little lukewarm towards faith matters, we're passionate about other things, our Lord says, I'm still here. I would still love to hang out with you to, at dinner time. I would love it if you hear my voice and respond to me today. When I, when I see a verse like this, I can't help but think back to a picture that was in my grandparents' house. I always thought this picture was kind of unique. Have you seen this picture before? Jesus knocking on a door. And I thought to myself, somebody needs to open the door. And maybe for us, when we place ourselves on our own self-centered thrones and we have these passionate pursuits, in order to open the door, we need to get off the throne. In order to open the door to Jesus eating with us and, and being with us and, and connecting with us through his word, we got to get off the throne of self, the throne of our own passions, seeking first the kingdom of more wealth, better clothes, newer medicine. That's what God calls us to do today. Step off the throne. Maybe a challenge to you today, I haven't given a lot of challenges in, in this series, is Find a time at dinner to, to allow Jesus to be on the throne of your life, your family's life. Maybe that's around the dinner table or in the car going from practice to home or wherever you're eating dinner to say, where did you see God today? Or maybe it's, hey, can I share the verse of the day from a Christian radio station? Or, hey, let's grab our Bibles. We're going to pull out Philippians chapter 2. Or let's grab our devotion book before we all leave and go do homework. In the busyness of life, let the Lord eat with you this week. That would be a good challenge. Dinner with a Perfect Stranger is a book related to that verse, Revelation 3.20. And for those of you that love reading and maybe have a little extra time this time of year, grab this book off of Amazon. It's an invitation worth considering as if Jesus was inviting you to dinner. And can you imagine the conversation you would have with our Lord? Jesus then says, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. 
just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We who have victory in Jesus, where are we going to sit? On his throne. What a promise we have from our risen and victorious Savior that we will sit in the throne room of heaven someday. That Why? Because Jesus left his rightful throne. He came to our earth. He put on a different crown, not a royal crown, but a crown of thorns for your sake and mine. I love the way Philippians 2 says it. Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he, Jesus, humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Our Lord, the master, the emperor of our lives, Jesus left that throne to die for your sake and mine. But he ascended. That's what we confessed. That's what we sang. And someday when we die, we too will sit on the throne for all who believe. What a glorious promise we have from our God. You know, when life gets busy, I suppose... The temptation is to hold on to anything that we can latch on to, just to hold on and see if I can survive. Too often that becomes self-centered. That becomes elevating ourselves onto the throne, pursuing other passionate things. And if there's a theological connection from the Christmas movie Elf, I'm going to make one today. It's not a very theological movie, but here's the connection You sit on a throne of lies. (laughs) If we're building a throne that has us sitting on it, and it's built on all the things we're passionate about, and Jesus isn't the one on the throne, it's a throne of lies. But our Lord Jesus reminds us of his grace and forgiveness again today. And today we're going to sing a song It's an old hymn, Jesus, Savior, Pilot, Me, and it's about not having lukewarm faith anymore. Here's my ask, that we would commit to not having lukewarm faith. Salem, do you think we can do this? Can we commit to this? Okay, wait, 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 wait. If you're willing to commit with me to not having lukewarm faith anymore, I need like raucous, passionate applause. Ready? Can we commit to this? Not, not lukewarm. We're not going to ride the fence. We're going to say, Lord, you are number one. You are risen. You are victorious. Jesus, Savior, pilot me. It's an old hymn. And Jordan requested this hymn today because it's mattered to him in his life through some dark seasons, even through the seasons of wondering what's next. He even told me that when we extended this divine call to come be our director of worship. Jordan said this song mattered to him. Jesus, Savior, pilot me. Our risen, victorious Lord, Master, Emperor, Jesus is the one that is leading and guiding and directing because he's on the throne and he's calling us to live this life until we join him for all eternity. Jesus, Savior, pilot me. And the very last line of the last verse of this song says, as if Jesus were talking to you, fear not, I will pilot thee. May that be true, Lord, in our lives today and for all the days we live on this earth. Let's pray about that today. Lord and Savior Jesus, you are the master. You are the ruler of all creation. Rule our hearts again today. Help us to respond to your call, to your knocking on our lives that feel so busy. Help us to respond in a way that gets us off the throne, but to have passion, to be zealous, to not have a lukewarm faith, but one that points to you as our number one. 
Lord, give us opportunity to spread that love to the world around us through the Red Letter Challenge. Bless us as we serve your people and may you receive all the glory and the honor. We thank you, Lord, that you are Savior today. Jesus, Savior, pilot me. In your holy name we pray, amen.